Right, the wonderful Dr. Lodell, Dr. Clyburn, and our resident historian. And uh, at this time, if everyone could silence or turn off their cell phones, that would be just a little bit better than perfect. We don't want to cut anybody off or interrupt any of uh, the excitement. And uh, without any further ado, we will begin our discussion of isolationism uh, as opposed to interventionism. So uh, would anybody like to begin? Where should we uh, start? Uh, should I start? Okay. Or maybe, you know, we, we feel probably a good idea if we tell people the positions that we I'll, I'll explain a little yeah. bit who I am, and, and uh, I have a little handout, because I like to always give people something to scribble on and, and write on. <laughs> Can you pass that? Yeah. I'm Dr. Lodell. I teach in the political science department, primarily um, international relations. I also teach uh, U.S. foreign policy. So this topic is kind of near and dear to me. Um, it's one we talk about a lot in my U.S. foreign policy class. And um, I certainly uh, don't always subscribe to one side or the other in this kind of debate. Uh, but uh, at least in some emails back and forth with the political science club, they uh, suggested perhaps talking a little bit more on the intervention side. Um, I'm not a, necessarily a big believer or defender in interventionism, but I think uh, at the same time, the idea is that we need to recognize that the United States may have some very important strategic interests around the world, which may uh, demand that the United States intervene, or there may be good uh, humanitarian or moral or ideological reasons for intervention, um, you know, it, it, it isn't necessarily an either or kind of thing or there's a clear kind of, uh, you're either this side or that side on this debate. So what I put together here was actually just my own thoughts and kind of borrowing uh, fairly liberally from Colin Powell and his so-called uh, Powell Doctrine, which really emerges in the thinking of many strategic and military thinkers after the debacle of Vietnam, <coughs> under what conditions should the United States intervene? Um, we obviously had, had, had learned some uh, difficult uh, lessons from Vietnam, so maybe we need to carefully think about the conditions and situation under which we should intervene. So what I put together was here's just some things to think about um, along the way. Uh, according to uh, Colin Powell, who I kind of uh, call the cautious realist, uh, realism is an intellectual and ideological and philosophical way of thinking about international relations and the behavior of states. And the idea is that uh, states should be um, actually fairly reluctant to intervene, um, but they may see it necessary or in its interest to intervene. Uh, and Powell kind of fits the mantra of the cautious realist uh, because he came up with six of these questions that everybody should ask uh, when thinking about the question, should we intervene or should we not intervene? And I think it's good to think about these questions if you're wrestling with, you know, should we intervene in Syria, for example? Or what should we do in the case of Iran and its perhaps nuclear uh, weapons development and not really understanding its intentions for that program? So here are the questions that uh, Powell came up with. Um, is the political objective we seek to achieve important, clearly defined, and understood? Um, the political objective isn't necessarily the military objective. It's the, you know, if we want, in the case of Syria, to get rid of the Hafez Assad, the, the uh, uh, Bashir Assad, <laughs> I'm stuck in the past, um, whatever Assad, all right, we want to get rid of, um, you know, is that the political goal? Do we really know exactly what we want to do there? What about in the case of Iran? What exactly is our political, do we have a political objective or is it just more of a narrow uh, military objective, which may suggest not intervening at all? Um, have all other non-violent policy means failed? So here, uh, Powell, uh, somebody who fought in Vietnam, who understands that the costs and burdens of intervention usually rest on the shoulders of those who have to fight the war, um, that uh, every other option available to the United States should be undertaken <coughs> before the use of force. Uh, and again, I think that's something we should be clearly thinking about in the case of uh, Iran or in the case of Syria for that matter. Um, will military force achieve the objective? So that goes back to the political objective. Does does using military might and military force uh, actually, will that actually achieve the political goal that we want? 
you could say we could intervene in the case of Iran, but would that actually achieve the goals that we want? Uh, what are the unforeseen consequences associated with that? Which is actually the fourth point, at what cost? Um, this could be economic costs, this could be military costs, this could be diplomatic and political capital that may be cost or lost in the case. Uh, there are a whole kind of series of cost-benefit analyses that Powell wants us to think about very carefully before intervening. Um, have the gains, in other words, you know, there's costs but the benefits associated with intervention, have those been kind of thoroughly thought through? Have they been analyzed? Have they been kind of vetted carefully enough? Have we kind of gone through a very careful, careful, deliberative process? And when I say deliberative, I think you should all be thinking about, you know, who exactly are making the decisions about intervention? Is it the president? Is it the president and his cabinet members and a group of close advisors? What about the Congress? Uh, Congress supposedly has this power to declare war and certainly has significant influence over this debate, but seemingly has been left out of a lot of the debates, and we could probably get into that with the isolationist side. Um, and the fifth, uh, sixth question, how might the situation that we seek to alter once it's been altered by force develop further and what might be the consequences? These are the kind of unforeseen consequences that could uh, you know, spill over from, you know, if you were to intervene in Iran and you make the argument that will, it'll be a narrow surgical strategic strike, who's to foresee what kind of consequences that could arise from that? And you've heard already you know, the Iranian threat coming back at the United States or towards Israel. Uh, there's a lot at play that may be very unpredictable and make, make the case against intervention much more stronger. All right? I'm just saying that you know, if the United States is going to intervene in this kind of post-Cold War world, it is good to follow some of these questions and use these questions as a bit of a guidepost, a map for policymakers uh, before we leap. I'm not saying don't leap, I'm saying think very carefully before we leap, before we intervene. A couple more conditions of support for intervention. These are kind of corollaries, if you will, to the Powell Doctrine. Uh, if you are going to intervene, act decisively in military terms. Uh, do not go halfway or only you know, um, slowly but steadily uh, before you know you get trapped or in a quagmire. If you're going to go in, go in all out. All right? And this clearly would be kind of the case of the first Gulf War, 1991, 1992. Uh, when the United States sought to um, push uh, Saddam Hussein, Iraq, out of Kuwait. Uh, this was, uh, you know, 500,000 troops sent to Saudi Arabia. Uh, I don't think anybody uh, could at that point, you know, underestimate that the United States was, are we in or are we out? We were fully in and we were going to, you know, <laughs> take care of business real quick. And that's part of the equation. The other side is to, is to limit military exposure to what's called kind of a tipping point. And this would be the case maybe in Libya, where you know we're not going to send you know troops and tanks on the ground to go kind of you know push uh, um, Gaddafi out of power, but if we see that kind of tipping point moment, perhaps when the Libyan um, you know insurgents and, and, and freedom fighters are to the point where maybe they could, with a little bit of aid, a little bit of support, we could kind of tip the balance in their favor, and perhaps in this case, you know the Obama administration, this is a good case for intervention. If you follow some of this thinking and you, you kind of find that right tipping point, you can push it in, in the correct direction. The question would be, what about for Syria? You hear a lot of debate, should we intervene in Syria? It's, it's similar to Libya. Civilians are being massacred. Um, I'm not quite sure we've reached that tipping point moment, but maybe it'll come and we should be ready to make the case for intervention if that time could come. A couple other quick conditions. Uh, an exit strategy, this is always the big one. Uh, that sometimes isn't thought through very carefully, uh, but we don't want to get entrapped in a long-term kind of occupation that's clearly going to be counter to our interests in the long term. Uh, there should be strong consensus at home. This could be congressional support, and I really emphasize the importance of Congress having a voice in, this, in any decisions about in intervention, military intervention obviously in particular, but also public opinion should be uh, in support of this. All right. And if you have some of those conditions met, that would make, again, for uh, a more successful uh, intervention. Uh, and international legitimacy. Uh, it is important that the United States seek out international legitimacy to uh, military invention, intervention. Uh, this could come through the United Nations, through the Security Council. That would probably be the ideal set. Um, it could come through other regional collective security arrangements like NATO. 
uh, or maybe the Arab League in the case of Libya where we foster together uh, a variety of NATO, Arab League, UN support for military intervention. Uh, it happened to be NATO kind of doing the military operation, but you had international legitimacy behind it. And that was the same also in the Gulf War, uh, the first Gulf War, all right? Um, so if you take, you ask these questions to kind of carefully deliberate and think about intervention, and you're coming up with the right answers, and you further consider the conditions under which you might use military force, kind of the corollaries prescribed below, um, maybe you could have some successful intervention, all right? And it may be for strategic reasons, i.e. oil, okay, let's be upfront, that is an important strategic uh, value and interest to the United States, it's in our national interest to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait in 1991, so we're going to intervene, use the following questions. Maybe there's a humanitarian or more moral kind of argument, in the case of Bosnia and Kosovo where you had ethnic genocide being committed uh, against innocent civilians. So if we haven't learned any lessons from the past, uh, is that we have to step in and you, we should use our kind of position of leadership and power to intervene on the, on the, on the side of, of you know, humanitarian um, you know, gestures of one short, sort or another. Um, Afghanistan, clearly this was more of a, 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 a straight national security. We were attacked and in justification, you can argue, you know, were we really attacked by Afghanistan? Nonetheless, the argument was made that the United States was attacked. We're acting in self-defense. The international community provided, you know, the blanket of legitimacy to our operations in Afghanistan, so we went ahead and did it. I don't think we asked all the correct questions up front, uh, or else we, we wouldn't be there still 10, 11 years on. Um, but the initial decision, I think, was a correct one to intervene. Uh, and there may be just a more of a, uh, again, an ideological one. Can we swing the tide of democracies in the Arab world in our favor if we uh, carefully kind of construct an international coalition in support of intervention, i.e. in Libya? We may be on the, on the right side of a longer historical trend or curve in the region, and better to play that tipping point kind of role to intervene. Um, and, you know, let's hope it works out in our favor in the end. Uh, but these are some of the things that I put together for us to think about and we can continue to discuss. Um, again, I'm not one to look back at the Cold War, for example, and, and say we, we were doing all the right kind of intervening back there. Uh, no. Um, but I think in the post-Cold War world, we have to more carefully think about U.S. leadership and responsibility in the international system and the conditions under which uh, we may, and, and maybe rightfully, use uh, American military power. Um, to intervene for the right reasons. So that's some of the things I put together and I'd be happy to ask, answer some questions or, or discuss. Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> These are all salient points made by Dr. Lodell, no question about this. I wish our decision makers were always as rational as as, as, as scholars are, no question about that. Um, under the case studies, though, I would add some other notable examples. In 1983, when Lebanon was torn by strife, when it seemed like there was the possibility of a war between Israel and its neighbor that Dr. Lodell made reference to, Syria, the United States and several of its Western European allies decided they would try to restore harmony and order in Lebanon by deploying peacekeepers to the country. President Reagan made this decision, and he was lauded initially for having done so. Unfortunately, this particular intervention was a catastrophe. Early on in our intervention in Lebanon, a suicide bomber drove a vehicle into a Marine barracks, where over 200 of our Marines were killed. Violence ensued. The United States found its troops being fired upon by various non-state actors, different terror organizations backed by Syria and other Islamic states throughout the Near East. It was a catastrophe. And after only a handful of months of having American peacekeepers in Lebanon, President Reagan was forced to quietly, quietly, discreetly withdraw all of our forces from Lebanon. It was a catastrophe. Of course, another example I could cite is that of Somalia in the early 1990s. 
in this case, former President George Herbert Walker Bush, once again committed a staggering number of troops, once again to a strife-torn country, in this case, presumably for humanitarian reasons, to try to deal with the famine in Somalia. And, of course, that too proved to be a catastrophe. We lost scores of our troops, innocent people were slain, the Black Hawk Down incident you're all familiar with that you seen in motion pictures and on television, it was another case of a rather ill-considered intervention on the part of the United States. One other thing that I would add to this, to the list before you here is long-term considerations. What are the long-term consequences of our military interventions and expeditions overseas? Right now, throughout the United States, we have countless veterans of foreign wars who have become vagabonds, who are living in absolute poverty, some are turning to law breaking. The Veterans Administration is already overwhelmed with the sheer number of people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, medical problems, who are missing limbs. How long can we really realistically keep this up? We're, we're already a society littered with people who have been victimized by all of our overseas commitments. I would say it's time for our decision makers to start asking themselves how much more can our military men and our personnel take? How much more can their families endure? Just how much more of, of this global hegemony can our forces withstand? Tanya to the Baylor Department of History. I, I, I mean, I must admit, I'm, you know, coming from a different angle because I'm going to come from a historical perspective. And I am going to give a quote, um, sort of set it off. And it was said from um, Eli Wenzel. He said, neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the torment. I'm going to sort of go back to the question of the United States. The United States has really never had a policy of, isolate, uh, of isolationism. We were in Canada by 1799. We were at um, Tripoli in 19, 1815. We were in Haiti in 1799, 17, 18, 14, and 15. And to give a more to really bring it home to you, I have to go back to something that we're in the period now studying the American Civil War. American Civil War, 100 and now 51 years ago. And there was a, you know, I'm from a region, the South, and that region declared that its own sovereignty. Basically, they said that there were a nation. We are the Confederate States of America. And that Confederate States of America sought other allies. They wanted to bring people to their cause. I'm gonna pause there. So you have the United States, the Union, and then you have the Confederate States of America, the Confederates. Now at issue in 1863, there was, a, there was something that was passed January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation. And what the Emancipation Proclamation did was basically, from my perspective, one of the crucial pieces that it did, it was allow the Union to basically have, to form the United States Colored Troops. And what the United States Colored Troops, a military force, was able to do was to basically make some decisive, participate in decisive battles that end up resulting into the Union victory. And in sort of a, most simplistic way, what you saw is that intervention against another nation, in this case, the Confederates who had declared their own freedom, if you will, they were able, using troops, they were able to basically bring about an end to the system of slavery in America. When I say that, I'm going to say an end to the labor system of America, because if you read the Constitution, slavery can exist if it's for punishment of a crime. But so for the most part, that's one piece. Let me just break it down for foreign policy. There are three things that I sort of see when I look at, should we go isolation or intervention? You have to sort of look at, I'm gonna again, this is gonna be the most basic example, but to sort of bring it home to you, literally. 
you can actually have things through of making a political statement, giving a sanction, then um, basically dedicating troops or armed forces, and then you can put boots to the ground. So to those four pieces. Now, here's my neighbor. I'm gonna, again, give you a very clear, basic example. My neighbor, <clears throat> across the street, elderly, okay? So my so kids over there smoking cigarettes, bothering the property, and the like sort. I tell the kid, hey, get off their property. That's me giving a political statement. So then the kids still go over there and decide that they wanted to face the land, mess up the grass, sit on the porch, whatever. Then I say, you know what? I'm gonna actually help. So that night that they're gone, I go out there and I put something out there, right? To try to stop a barrier for them getting in the lane. That's like a sanction. All right, so the kids still make it over there in the land. They still make it. They're still harassing the neighbors. So I decide I'm gonna call the police. Oh, what I've done now. Basically issued out some armed forces. Now, when that fails, my political statement, my sanction, and my calling the police. Because, you know, the kids get to the point where they know how to scatter when the police come. The minute that I go over there, when they're on that person's property, I'm over there, the minute I touch that land, I'm boots to the ground. That's like, in essence, how our interests work. The larger question of isolation and intervention depends upon context. It depends upon basically um, what, how is it gonna preserve our way of life in America, basically. And then also, like, what's the interest? What do we get out of it? How do we preserve our American way of life? And then the second piece I think that we, we must consider is um, again, what is the context? Because see, guess what? A few years ago, people were collecting for Haiti. Oh, the earthquake happened. Oh, Haiti, Haiti, let's go help Haiti. Let's go this and that. The first people on the ground for Haiti was the United States military troops first, the 40 peacekeepers. Tsunami. Oh, you know, oh, first thing on the ground. Intervention works various ways. And you have to look at the context. And going back to that neighbor's examples, when you have exhausted various pieces, boots to the ground now becomes necessary. When you look at our Constitution, I'm a constitutionalist. Any one of my students know I focus a lot on the Constitution. So for the most part, our Constitution, our governing document for this wonderful country of ours, what happens is that you, we are, the Congress is allowed to maintain the military. The president, in his solemn oath, says he's going to look for the general welfare of the people. If the general welfare of the people is now in our interventionist stance, then I say we should do it. Just like my neighbor. My interest is because that neighbor of mine her, if her property value goes down, so does my value. If anything should happen, if one happens, it start, a bunch of kids start deciding that first it starts off with a few kids coming over, then they realize they can get away with it, now you start getting hordes of kids coming over. Now that's gonna end up infringing upon my area. One of the questions that was asked is that, you know, shouldn't we go into areas like Southeast Asia? <laughs> Of course, we should. How much of our stuff come from India? How much of our stuff come from China? How much of our stuff come from the Philippines? How many Americans are willing to risk what we have in our way of life in order for us not to be Up here. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience at this point in time? 
Mr. Cup. There's some more of my handouts if anybody, sorry Mike, I didn't want to interrupt you. If anybody wants in. Uh, primary question uh, goes to uh, listed examples that Clyburn uh, also gave to throw in um, the Iran Contra scandal of what we uh, the debacle that turned into, as well as uh, Afghanistan, our first round uh, with Afghanistan in terms of uh, promoting insurgency against uh, the Russians or the former Soviet Soviets. Uh, yeah, you're impulsive to beat me unless the Russians. Um, the Soviets became exactly not. In fact, we kind of dedicated the challengers, the freedom uh, the fight of challenge to the freedom fighters of uh, Afghanistan. And we see the repercussions that have come out of that action. Uh, when, does it become, when does our intervention overseas become a potential risk to us domestically? when it was our actions overseas. How do we gauge that in terms of uh, looking through history of what we've done and then repercussions of that, especially when we're fighting not uh, for the interest of something that would be directly in relationship to the United States' prosperity, but rather an ideology? There's a lot in that question, Mike. It's a, it's a, good, it's a really good question. There's, there's some really intriguing parts to that. Um, the one about unforeseen consequences uh, would be kind of question six, right? I mean, if we let's take Afghanistan in 1979 and the early 1980s, we support the you know anti-Soviet, anti-communist Mujahideen fighting against the Soviet invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. Um, the fact that we end up you know supporting these various groups who, in some form or another, wind their way back towards the United States. 20 years later on 9-11, for example. Um, this is something that would be, you know, a, an unforeseen consequence, but probably very, very difficult, at least to initially kind of sense. I think, you know, we were living in the context of the time of the Cold War, and if you ask some of these questions here, you probably are getting some pretty good answers. Yes, it's okay to intervene, although again, the intervention was more you know, provide military aid, some intelligence, uh, some covert support of one sort or another. So it was a very limited kind of intervention with really kind of maxim, you know, <coughs> very high gains to be had, all right, by harassing and shooting at the Soviets, eventually kind of bogging them down, which, you know, maybe played a part in the, in the eventual implosion of the Soviet Union, perhaps. So at the time, it may have seemed like a reasonable argument in favor of intervention, but on a very kind of small, covert uh, economic and military assistance kind of probably It wasn't that small. I mean, it was fairly significant. Um, the other part had to do with, uh, was, it, was it about presidential power or something related to that in the context of Iran-Contra? Because you started off your question. I started off um, just throwing out that as an example. Um, I'm saying that we're going into these conflicts, kind of pursuing an ideal of, I'm just going to throw out that world policing approach. Um, when does that overextension then become a liability? I think that you're asking a larger question because basically what you're saying is that when does self-interest, right, override, um, when can it be dangerous? And I think that everyone, I mean, excuse me, Frederick Douglass said it best, power concedes nothing without a struggle. Um, and so, where would you want to be on the spectrum? Would you rather, rather be, okay, at the top, the middle, or the bottom? We're trying to be on top. So self-interest is always going to decide one context in the context of when a situation, as best we know how, as much information that we're given. We don't know all the intel that goes on. So as best that we can basically um, protect our interests and protect the way that we live, as much as we can do that, when we're going in, as hindsight is 2020. So for the most part, it's the best decisions that we can make at that time is the best decisions that we can make at that time. And when we try to go and sort of read things backwards, you're gonna run into a problem because for the most part, you already know the end of the story. 
one of the difficult things about teaching history is that it's very difficult to get people excited about the Civil War because they already know who won. Okay? They already know who won World War I. They already know who won World War II. So it's very difficult because they already know the end of the story to understand the nuances, the buildup. But for the most part, when you look at it from an interventionalist standpoint, you have to sort of look at it in the form of what is the interest and how is that interest going to basically, um, again, preserve you know, what we know to be our way of life? I mean, like, for example, I'm going to give you an example um, that very, seems very simple. All right, people go up and they recycle. In my neighborhood, we recycle every Thursday. They have a nice green container. Everyone puts out their recycling pieces. Ah. Uh, where does it go, if I ask my neighbors? I don't know, to the appropriate recycle place. Most people don't know. If I ask you in this room, some of you I'm sure you will know. When I ask you, how many cell phones have you had? How many computers have you had? Oh, I've had several. What happens when you basically decide to discard one and go and buy another? Well, you know, I recycled it, I turned it in, and they gave me a rebate on it. And so it just went to that place. You don't ever think that when you're seeing those barges that's on the ports, a lot of your stuff, your technology is there. You are environmentalists when it's convenient, but those places are going over to Ghana, China, India, the very places that we're not supposed to intervene that's where your toxic dump is going. But most people don't have the concept of where that goes. So to answer your question, in our self-interest, even dealing with our technology, right? We can basically look at technology and see that you have most people who are not even informed right now where it goes. So to ask about long-term impact, the one thing that we have right now is, I don't want this dump in my backyard. Well, I think there are larger issues here that our policymakers need to take into consideration. Any of you who have taken Dr. Polsky's international relations class or a class with Dr. Modell know a thing or two about international politics and the Westphalia system of international relations, call it whatever you wish. You understand that we have actors, nation states, and you understand that they are supposed to be sovereign nation states. What has become of this concept of sovereignty? Does the United States no longer believe that nation states should be sovereign actors? We don't seem to. We wage war upon Saddam Hussein in the early 1990s. Why? Because he violated the sovereignty of a neighboring state, Kuwait. We wage war upon Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan because they violated the sovereignty of their neighbors, of neighboring countries, because they invaded their neighbors, because from the standpoint of the Nazis and the Imperial Japanese, their national security interests were at stake. Are we committed to principles like sovereignty, or are we not committed to these principles? We seem to be engaging in a bit of hypocrisy when it comes to this subject of interventionism. We say we don't want international anarchy, where any country can occupy, we need to understand that we are setting precedents here. Precedents that other countries will follow. Recently, about quite a year and a half ago, the Russian Federation launched an incursion onto the soil of Georgia, a sovereign country. The United States and other parties objected to this. But who are we to criticize the Russians when we're going around invading everyone, occupying any territory that we wish at every turn? It, it puts us in a position where we cannot condemn other states and other nations. We are setting a precedent that aggressor nations may follow at a later date. We are putting ourselves in a very awkward position ideologically and in terms of public relations, so to speak. And where our hypocrisy, I think, is evident. Either we believe in the sovereignty of independent nation states, or we don't. It's a tricky, tricky question. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, more questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point, though. Very good point. Okay, I guess I go. Um, 
It was brought up earlier about the about trying to get international legitimacy to intervention. Um, how exactly do you go about judging how to get international um, international legitimacy, given that the people we generally seek the the acceptance from Germany, France, Britain are our fellow major imperialist powers of the world. Should are they the ones that we really should be trying to convince, or are they, or are they places like Argentina and Mexico and other places that have been the major victims of imperialism over the centuries and therefore better judges of it, and yet we don't value their opinion as highly, where should we seek our legitimacy? Or is that even a real concern trying to get this legitimacy? Mm. It's a really good question, Nick, and, and I don't really have a good response because you know the UN Security Council system is not functioning very well to really give you a a valid stamp of international legitimacy, I think, as, as we might hope it would work. It's an imperfect system. It's a broken system. It's the veto system is, is an odd afterthought creation <coughs> after World War II. It doesn't mean that you can just kind of turn and hide from at least some establishment, international organizations or institutions to make a case, make a case to the world and let people hear, make the diplomatic arguments uh, and political arguments in favor, if you're making the case for intervention, for example, uh, to be involved. And, you know, um, if you can get enough of those states to raise their hand, and there might be a Mexico, and it might be an Argentina, and it might be a South Africa, and it might be, you know, countries from different parts of the world, and if they're raising their hand in support, again, it's not a majority, it's not, you know, 51% of the of the General Assembly of the United Nations or something like that, although occasionally you do get resolutions in the General Assembly of you know, over 90 nations who are saying, yes, we need to do something in the case of Syria, for example. Um, you know, we, we, we work with the best that we have, and it's, it's not the most perfect system to kind of get a real, you know, clear poll of what international approval is, but it's what we've got. And the United Nations, for better, for worse, uh, lays out certain uh, prescriptions for behavior of states uh, and lays out rules of engagement for states. It provides, you know, justifications for intervention if necessary. Um, and, you know, look at the United Nations Charter of Human Rights, one of the most powerful documents that exists in the world. If you were to say that, and go back to sovereignty, that, you know, if we just turn a blind eye to the atrocities uh, in Bosnia or in Kosovo, for example, we are turning our backs on the very international organizations which elevate human rights to this high level and around which perhaps we can try to build at least imperfect legitimacy and consensus about the case for intervention. Um, you know, what, what, what else might we have in the end? Uh, so I'm not, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I'm saying we, we should work within the avenues that exist because they are the only ones we have to providing at least a modicum of uh, you know, approval, you know, we're not all, you know, six billion people, seven, how many are all standing up and saying yay or nay? Of course not. Um, the representatives through these various international bodies are there. Um, imperfect, I understand. That's, that's what I would say. If we take our hands out of the cookie jar as to say we rescind our forces from many nations that we do have troops in, then we take our hands out of control over a lot of economic opportunity and wealth that we do control now, then how do we fund situations like Uganda where nobody did go in at first and a lot of atrocities and horrific crimes were committed? How, how do we fund then going there if we don't have people like I was discussing earlier that pretty much today we had troops across the the world where in 30 minutes we could land a brigade in any country we wanted, if we needed to. If suddenly we rescind that power, That's right. and I'm not, I'm not arguing necessarily we should or shouldn't, but if we rescind the power, what then happens? Like who funds helping our fellow human beings, if you will, in situations like that? And, you know, I don't know. I guess that was rhetorical, really. I was more <laughs> just putting it out there. But, no, Jesse, I think you have a, a good point. Question. I mean, you have a good point in the sense that, and this is where Professor Claiborne and I are going to be on different sides of the fence here. 
I, I don't necessarily see this whole sovereignty and self-determination. Um, we have a country to defend. And we have a way of life that we need to defend. And so if that means that I think the idea is not necessarily, when you start going to morality issues, we didn't go into the far, we didn't go into Rwanda. You know, I mean, because why? Our interests weren't there. So what happens is that I don't necessarily go off of, I mean, I think our policy should not base, be based on what is morally right, as opposed to what is going to basically help us advance and keep our number one status as a super nation so no one come and play in our yard and realize that if you play, if you play with them, if, you, if you're gonna come and play with us, you better come legit and real and powerful. But from my standpoint, then how are we indistinguishable from Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan? If that's going to be our approach, this social Darwinistic approach to things, uh, how, how, how can we distinguish ourselves from an aggressor nation? Sorry, you guys have questions. Yeah. Yeah, I have um, Yeah. I guess there's a problem with the way that you're using our way of life and what that means because I feel like you're going about it almost from like materialistic standpoint as opposed to a liberty standpoint. Like what about our way of life? What's happening to our free speech when they're not going through Congress? Isn't that more of a threat to us than us losing material things? First, we have to realize that we are a nation full of consumers. I have a statement here that I would like to just read. I hate to sort of take it, but this is part of my piece before I knew how the format was going to go. I, was, I said here, I have the American way of life is not negotiable. Um, our own way of life is special and unique. Americans, you know, we, we do believe in something about, like let's take something like global warming. However, let's just look at this. Should our government do something about it? Should our international community do something about it? Should the United Nations do something about it? But whatever they do is supposed to be done in a way that protects the right of Americans consumers to consume. Sales of SUVs continue to rise, even as we involve ourselves in, um, in wars in the Middle East to ensure ourselves a plentiful supply of cheap gas, and at most, only a handful of consumers will accept the rise in prices at the gas pump. We continue to eat out regularly, frequently drive fast food restaurants that really serve us tasteless food in styrofoam containers to keep it warm. We can continue to buy everything disposable, using things only once and throwing them away. We continue to drive wherever we want to go, even if it's a couple of blocks away. We continue to keep our lights on when there is no need for them. America contains 5% of the world's population, and we account for 25% of the world's consumption. We are the largest per capita producers of trash, right? Um, our carbon dioxide emissions account for 25% of the world's total. In short, we are not, using, not only using our fair share of the world's resources, we are, each and every one of us, also using a fair share of four other people. The saddest part of this orgy of consumption is the research that has been done on the human happiness. We are not a happy nation when you sort of look at it, as long as we can go and buy a, a DVD or a new dress or the like sort. And I'm saying that to say that most Americans, when I was talking about the way of life, most Americans are not going to consider the things that we do. That's why I brought up what happens to your phone, what happens to your computer. We're basically, we are consumers, and we do consume, and that's just a part of our fabric. Not in one document, like the Constitu the uh, what is it, not the, Amer the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution, not in one of the 50 constitutions in any place in this country would you find the word democracy. That's just something that I think that that's just part of the piece. So our way of life is our liberty, unfortunately, our liberty to consume, our liberty to basically feel safe. That's the American way of life that basically we have already invested in the president to protect. And so for the most part, that's that way of life that I'm talking about. 
So you want our soldiers to die so we can devour hamburgers, Tanya? I, I just... That's not what I'm saying, but guess what? We're sitting in a room having a conversation because someone has died. Undoubtedly, for our for 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 American democracy, for our civil liberties, I don't think for our consumer rights or our right to go to Burger King. That's right? all, that's all of our. That means regarding you, what you're doing now is you're trying to basically put some type of like a moral spin. Or, it's all of it. It's our right to not only consume and eat a hamburger, but it's our, also our right to feel safe from another nation. And so at, what point, at what point do we feel safe when everyone else is deceased? I mean, what, when does one feel secure exactly? Uh, at one point, we have these discussions all the time, by the way. So. <laughs> Are you actually believe all this stuff? <laughs> I Are you being a provocateur we, over yeah. here? <laughs> we Which I, must, I don't doubt for a second. No. <laughs> Wait, I, mean, I believe that. Well, hold on. We do, your hand was up as a follow up before I go. Yeah, I guess I'm just confused. Because what you're saying is is that we should go around the world to con so we can to con continue to consume, and yet you're bringing up all the problems with consuming. So pretty much we're just going around the world so we can continue to do things that are bad for ourselves, you get bad for the rest of the people, <coughs> bad for the entire society, bad for the entire world. And yet we have to continue doing it because it's within our fabric. Why can't we just change our fabric? Well, here, 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 is, the, here is the piece. And this is what I was saying about looking at the reality, not at some fictitious picture. And that's why earlier I brought up, we've never been isolation. 